Hey everybody! It's time for a little uh, constructive gardening here by my apartment. So, rather than serenade you all with the magic that is a truly original Tom Lommel theme song, um, we're just listening to that for you know another. <clears throat> Yeah, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. If you're having problems with the audio, let me know. I have a brand new webcam. I'm broadcasting to you from this new webcam that Mr. James V was so kind to uh, to shoot over. So this is the new Logitech, and it allows me to do a two-camera setup, which get, 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 get. Let's, uh, let's quick take a look. Ready? Look at this. Look at this! Look at this! Pretty cool. So, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it looks like the CPU usage is not crazy. No, actually, it's pretty good. 18%. So, we're doing great. So, yeah, we'll be using this, um, we'll be using this two camera setup to, to, you know, I show you guys stuff, and I always like to have hands on things, and I don't always scan and drop everything in. So we'll be going back to that in a moment. And that reminds me, I want to bring a couple photos in. But we're going to do that. We'll do that after uh, after we get through the agenda. So what is the agenda today? Hey, everybody. We're going to talk about setting up the showcase, number one. We're going to talk about session versus style. Hmm. I don't know. What does that mean? Got some things in my mind, people. Uh, and then third, finally, we're going to do a little, we're going to bat a little cleanup here with Dead Men Plants. It's down, I can't even point that far. Dead men, plants, and other plot threads, right? So we're going to ping our plot radar. We're going to talk about uh, a couple things that, uh, a couple of thematic things, elements that got introduced last night that, uh, you know, maybe caught me by surprise, too. Let me know if that is super annoying. I don't know what I'm going to do in the meantime, but let me know if that is super, super annoying. Uh, it's bothering me, but not a lot I can do about it right now. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Mute me if you, if you dare. If you dare. All right. So, setting up the showcase. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the design intention behind last night's session, how it played out, uh, what what my thinking was going into the game last night, right? Like, what I wanted to accomplish and achieve. And, you know, we hinted, or we, we did discuss this fairly, I, I guess, extensively. Or we, we brainstormed a lot on Tuesday, and I think I, I brought all this stuff into focus last night, as I was, or yesterday, as I was prepping, right? So I want to talk a little bit about, like, setting up what last night's scenario was all about. Because... Those of you who have the book know that I strayed from the adventure as written by having this sort of dynamic response of the goblins. Yeah, the landscapers sure are outside. I apologize for all this, you guys. Let me just lean in and talk to you a little bit more directly, a little bit more intimately if you will. So, last night's session was, as, as I put it together, it was designed to be a showcase combat, right? Like, that was that was the whole session. There was an ambush by the goblins. The goblins were going to bring in, basically, full force. They're bringing in everything they got, and they were going to overwhelm the kobolds. And they didn't necessarily know about the party, but they might have had a suspicion. They might have had some suspicion that the kobolds had reinforcements, right? Like, the party didn't clean up after the dead bodies, so I'm sure, like, seeing those guys with, like, 50 arrows in each of them might have tipped them off that, that something else was going on. Hopefully they're almost done. I think they got one more tree to go here. <clears throat> So that was my 
That was my intention, right? Two things, right? Number one, show to the players it's a dynamic dungeon. There's consequences, you know, when, or not consequences, but there's a response. When you take action, the world is going to be dynamic and respond in some way, shape, or form. In this case, it was responding with very, you know, a very deliberate show of force. Right? That's not always, that doesn't always have to be the response of the inhabitants of your dungeons. Some people can like pack up their crap and bail out. Oh, this is we're in over our head. I don't know what's going on, but let's let's if we can cut you know cut ties and cut the anchor line and get out of here. Let's go. So I'm not I don't I don't mean to suggest that the response to every time a players do something you know like have a a, a moment of glory or a show. of of force themselves that the enemies in the dungeon are going to respond in kind. It's not it's, that that's I don't think that's that's the easy way out. I chose to take the easy way out because for one thing the players were just getting to be level 2, they had some new abilities. I wanted to push them a little bit. I wanted to test them. I wanted to temper them in the fire a little bit if you will, right? So that was the intent. Like the intent was, this is going to be a the whole session is going to be a, a big slog kind of combat um, scenario. Like we're basically going to have a one single showcase fight tonight. Let's make it a good one. It's going to be a tough one. And here we go. Like let's let's fire it up. So I want to talk a little bit about like what how I set it up, and I want to talk a little bit about how it played out. Okay. Uh, let me, let's see, let's flip over. I want to show you a couple things. We're going to go over to, into show and tell time. All right. Now, let me add a couple images here. Oh, they might be done. Can you believe it? Where is it? It's this one. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Back. Let me break this down just slightly. That's pretty good. All right, I'm going to turn off the turn this off. So let's take a look at this, right? Um, this is my round by round. <laughs> I can't I can't touch it because it's not here. This is my round by round timeline. Okay of how the combat was going to play out. So coupled with the map, which I don't have in this particular setup, but coupled with the map, this tells me how the... Uh, this is my roadmap to how the assault is going to play out. So I have what the actions and the what the actions and the moves are on the top. You know, I'm going to turn this webcam back on. We're going to side-by-side -side this thing. day. All right. So, in this column, which you can see in more detail on the left, I have what my actions are. Obviously, this is the this is my round by round uh, rundown of what's going to happen for each of these each each round after as the combat starts, All right? So that's that's fine, that's cool. Move this over a little bit. Good enough. I have my round by round rundown. These are my actions. These red circles are what area they move into, what, what keyed area they move into on the map. I have a column here. This column is the number of cobalt casualties. That's what the KC stands for. Okay? 
Uh, and I know that uh, GC is the number of goblin casualties, which, looking at the looking at the stats for the goblins and the kobolds, a goblin can pretty much kill a kobold around, right? If they hit, that's that's if they hit. So, and they're going to hit fifty percent of the time. That means two goblins can kill one kobold. But two kobolds cannot kill a goblin. It really takes three or four kobolds to kill a goblin. And if they don't have that many people to bring to bear, it just doesn't work, right? So this was my roadmap. My, my intent in prepping this out was to give me a round-by-round -round rundown of what's happening independent of the players. Because I've got two different groups who are, who are fighting off-screen, as it were. And so depending upon how the players reacted, I wanted to know at what point do the players enter the combat? At what point do they come in? How, how are things going depending upon how they, how they respond, right? As it turns out, the way that they responded was to kind of like dink around with the old man's body a little bit and be like, oh, well, I hear problems, I hear trouble, and kind of like spend, I would say, a couple rounds like getting their act together. So by the time that they came in, it was round four on my list here, right? That means like round four, at least five, if not if not nine kobolds are dead. And that's problematic. Um, let me turn my phone down, sorry. Oh my god. <clears throat> All right. So I, I agree, this is probably the most most organized session I may may have run recently but I wanted to have like a good idea I didn't want it what I what I hate what, what always makes me feel uncomfortable as a DM is I know that there's some sort of set piece thing happening or there's there's some stuff happening off stage and I don't have the logical plausible pieces about why this is happening in this particular order or whatever right so I wrote this down and it took me half an hour maybe to figure it out but I looked at the map and I figured out like okay I'm gonna send ten goblins and a shaman this way and then the other forces are gonna come in the back door but this just gets me like five rounds and gets gets me to kinda of like freelance it allows me to create an entry point for the players right and I will also do this if I'm having a boss battle and I'm not sure, like the guy has, the, the, the villain has so many abilities that I don't know what their best opening move is. I will write down like, okay, here's the first three or four rounds. He, he casts this, he tries to do this, he holds this in reserve. Now he's out of fifth level spell slots. He's going to start up casting second level spells to fourth, etc., etc., etc. Like, I just like to have notes like this. Number one, even if I don't use these things, it helps me have a plan in my mind. Like, oh, let's see, oh he's going to upcast that spell. Oftentimes I forget those details. That's why I like to have them written down. Okay. So that's... This, this, this was more for the benefit of knowing where the players came in versus knowing how, how, the, how the goblins were going to respond to the players. So this is really the combat of the goblins fight the kobolds. It does not take into account any actions by the party. Okay, but this was a very helpful thing. I like to just take it's. This is just a blank piece of paper. Like there's nothing else on here. I just like to have it in this kind of like this is a nice format, right? Okay. The other thing that I did. No. Where is it? It's this one.
Okay, so this thing is an HP tracker, right? So, so I now have with with this thing, I have uh, a place to. I've got all my hit points all in one place, right? So not only that, but you'll notice that uh, along the <laughs> along the side over here, I have a few notes about things that I want to include, elements that I want to include, like. Maybe the 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 blights avoid tack, or um, this whole they they brew they, there's this brew that they're drinking. Uh, there's something that they a war cry that they chant, etc., etc., etc. Right? Dragon mayhem. Like I just I just noted some things that I wanted to happen during the combat. So that way, every time I'm looking at my character at, at my little roster of who's got what hit points, I go, okay, oh yeah, I can I can I can refer to that stuff. So I'm just making little notes for myself. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm getting old, my memory's getting bad, or more likely what it is is I've got so many inputs that I'm juggling at one time that it's easy to forget about these little tiny, like, little sprucey up details that you want to add, right? So that's, th those are the things that I did. Those are, those are the setup pieces that I did. Um, let's get rid of some of this stuff. You know, so we looked at this on 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 Monday or on Tuesday, but I also I looked at the map. I put the forces on the map. I decided who's coming in which way. I, I looked at where the combat was going to take place. I, um, you know, there was a spike growth thing that was going on here that the party never actually uh, knew about. That's what the concentration thing was. Uh, I knew that the boss is coming in the back and he's going to attack this way. So I, I had the setup. I had the flanking maneuver. I had the initial push. It all worked out. Okay? Great. Let's go back over here. So, oh, guys, this is how... Bloody recap. <clears throat> So now let's just talk briefly about the combat itself, how the combat itself went. I felt that the all, all of my design goals were laid out fairly well for the most part. Okay? So I thought the forces trickled in, the goblins had an advantage, the party kind of whittled them away, and then just when the party was sort of faced with the bleakest possible outcome like they were on the tipping point of winning but they're also on the tipping point of being KO'd the big boss arrives and they kind of have to like second wind and push through and defeat the boss right so all of those design goals if you've watched disorganized play before um, one of the one of the techniques that I like to use is a rolling thunder technique where you start with a bunch of minions or mooks who are relatively weak but kind of drain party resources and then you start sending in successive waves of monster after monster that get increasingly tougher and then as their resources are going down your DM resources are, are sort of going up but you, you find that sweet balancing spot in the middle then it's not overwhelming right obviously you can use um, you can rig the encounter to your advantage if you choose but that's that's DMing 101. That's just cheap, right? Oh, now we're in for a little treat of blowing. Gas blower. And the FedEx guy is coming up here. This looks disturbing. Maybe it's not for me. Not for me. Guys, we dodged the mailman. Dodged the bullet. All right. So, in terms of setting up this as a showcase combat, like, it... It executed the way it was designed. The way I planned this thing to go off was exactly how it went off. Uh, the party is surprised by the goblin's sudden incursion. They spend a couple of rounds digging around with their equipment or otherwise engaged with not immediately getting to the site of the battle. The goblins waltz in, establish sort of a beachhead with their bows, and start just hammering anything that comes into sight. Just blah, 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 fire, fire, fire. Um, uh, most stuff down, right? And then, as they take care of the this island of archers who've set themselves up in the Hall of Dragons, 
the boss man comes in the back and either creates havoc with the dragon or turns on the party. You know, or t turns turns up and ambushes the party. So it all worked exactly as I planned. And I thought I used the bad guys to the best of their ability. I thought they had sound tactics. I thought they had reasonable responses to what the what the what the party did, what the party's tactics were. I don't think I softballed too hard on uh, Ustrail or anybody like that. There were casual there's a lot of Cobalt casualties, but Ustrail managed to like barely kind of skid that one out. So I thought the combat the combat went as designed. Okay. Now, let's move on to our second topic. So that was that was my prep. I'm very like I put a lot of work into it and I created a game plan and it played out as I anticipated. Like it it went largely according to plan with a few um with a few hiccups and surprises on the part of the party there. But, you know, no plan survives contact with the party, right? And not only that, but it, it was... The plan that I set up was designed to sort of stand independent of what the party did. And I knew I was going to have to adjust based on, oh, okay, well, they're going to go intercept him or turn the dragon on him. He can't just go and take care of the dragon. Like, I thought they would all kind of pull into that hallway, but they did not do that, um, which is fine. So... I developed a game plan for the session. I executed that game plan. Let's talk about session versus style. So I delivered the experience that I had intended to deliver. I don't think that the... I really apologize for this, you guys. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um... I don't think that this session was as enjoyable for the players as previous sessions. You know, just from my kind of checking in around the table and what's going on, it was a lot of dice rolling, it was a lot of math, it was all combat, and it wasn't all combat, but it was mostly combat. It was really kind of a race to empty the bucket of hit points and, and, it was one of our longer sessions, and I feel like, uh, you know, at the end of it, I was sort of drained. I think the players were sort of drained, and they didn't get some of the opportunities that they normally like to indulge in, right? They didn't get to do any riddles. They didn't get to do any role-playing. They didn't get to diffuse any traps, unlock any mysteries. They got some treasure, but not a lot. We didn't dramatically forward the plot or reveal major pieces of the plot in ways that were striking. We hinted at a bunch of stuff, but there was no definitive reveals at the uh, at the end of the night, right? So, this is something that every DM struggles with. And you know, I want to point you guys back to Tuesday when I said I'm going to give you advice and hopefully you can learn from the mistakes that, you know, I've already made in the past or go to school on some of the mistakes that I make right here on camera for you. And I feel like the way that I set up this particular session was overambitious and not particularly well-timed plot-wise and did not mesh seamlessly with the preferred play style of most of the players in my group, right? So let me just break that down a little bit. Overambitious. Just too much, too many forces. It just went on way too long. If I had uh, an hour and a half combat and then an hour and a half of role-playing and whatnot, I think that would have been fine. But the whole session dedicated to one thing. That was wrong. Um, did not fit in plot-wise or, or poor timing plot-wise. It was supposed to be sort of a it was supposed to be a surprise ambush. And that's fine, but that means that the players had no idea that it was coming. And so in terms of 
pacing of the adventure where they're going down, da 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 da. They just leveled up. Okay, it's a brand new day, and then wham, slap them in the face with a huge, big, you know, grueling knockdown, drag out combat scenario. It would have been better if they maybe had had been worried a little bit, or there's some for some more foreshadowing or something like that. But this huge battle, it's fun to say. Uh, it's fun to say that you're going to be working your way up to the grand showdown with the general and all of his forces arrayed, the big bad and his lieutenants and all of his minions. You know, you need to fight your way to the temple interior or something like that. Like, there's an element of anticipation to that giant boss fight. But when you do what I did last night, you just drop that giant boss fight directly in into the player's laps it can be very jarring, and I felt like, like pacing-wise, over the arc of our sessions, it was a jarring moment in the pacing. All right, so that's the second thing. And then thirdly, it did not mesh seamlessly with the play styles at the table. You know, look around, right? So, Grav likes shooting things, you know, he likes shooting things with his bow. That's what his character is great at, but he also enjoys role-playing. Um... Eric enjoys being the tank and being the strong, stern, silent type, but there's also a great element of role playing there where he sort of gets to, his character gets to sit back and judge people, right? And then both Amy and Havana want to Amy wants to unwrap the mystery of what's going on with her character. She wants to explore the burgeoning power that is awakening within her. And Havana's character wants to pull swindles on people, and do investigation and exploration and find stuff, right? But while at the same time, like, kind of needling Grayson about what a stick in the mud he is, okay? If you go around and you just take inventory of everybody who's sitting at your table, and then you only play to one play style for that whole session... It better be a firecracker session. And they better, like, you need to you need to work uphill to get them on board with, oh, this is that thing that we're going to make. Just like if you have players who just want to hack and slash and aren't into riddles, you need to, like, build up their enthusiasm, try and get them hooked on, okay, well, just keep in mind, you know, there's a maze at the end of this dungeon complex or whatever. So, it's it's... So important to understand the hooks that your players bite off on, to understand their kind of psychological, like what they're bringing to the table, and uh, I mean, I, <laughs> it's like so. So Bastion feels, I think, is like I appreciate that you know you're quoting some stuff that, that Vanna said and that, that uh, you know, she she really appreciates being in L.A. And I'm glad she's at the table. And I don't mean to beat myself up in terms of, like, that was a terrible session. I don't feel it was a terrible session. But I want to make sure that you guys all know, like, okay, I think I went into this thing. Here's, here's the main takeaway. I went into this thing with the best of intentions, and I really put a lot of energy and effort into planning this session. And then it didn't play out the way that I maybe anticipated or the way that I wanted it to. And that's okay. The players still had a decent time. They didn't have their max <laughs> maximum fun time, right? That's fine. Like, not every session... You can't... My whole point is, you can't hit it out of the park every single time. Nobody's... I mean, there's... Somebody's a super DM, but even I'm not... I can't hit it out of the park every single time. So I, I went after this thing. I tried it. We played it out, but I also like look back at the end of the night and I go, I can't, I, I, I got to be careful when I do this again. I got to learn something from the experience that happened here. Everybody was fine and had a good time, but going forward, I need to be cognizant. Okay, well, this is what these people are really into, so let's serve them more of what they like and put some vegetables on the plate, rather than just serving them the vegetables on the plate. And going, well, this is going to be good for you. Put some butter on it. So, 
so that's 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 really where I want to you know those, those those are really my my two big points is is I did it I did it I feel like you know I did a terrific job prepping and going into the game last night apart from getting caught in traffic which is a unexpected nightmare and I made a mistake on the way driving there which is which made it even worse but apart from that. I felt like I was really prepared. I knew what was going on. I had a great game plan. Um, and I executed that game plan 95% of the way that I wanted to execute it. The entire encounter went off as designed. And yet, at the end of it, I go, okay, even though that went exactly as I wanted it to, it's not. it didn't go exactly the way that the players will want things to go. So, 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 Feel good about putting, you know. I feel good about putting that energy and effort into running that combat. It's it was it was a lot of inner moving parts. There was a lot of moving around on the on the battle map and that sort of thing. But the flip side of it was okay. Well, let's just step back and take a uh, take inventory of how everybody's responding. And and it's not like anybody was like, oh, that sucked. You know, nobody said anything bad to me after the game. This is just me perceiving, taking a look around the table and going. Okay, let's make sure that we serve the hooks that they they want to bite off on, and that's that's an extremely difficult lesson to really take to heart. Is you have this great idea of like, oh, this is going to be a really cool fight, and this will be really fun, and it'll be really tactical, and I don't know. And if you don't sort of like just take a moment and take stock and go, what happened? Then you will eventually lose your players. You know, that's the thing. So it's not that they complain to me. The, 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 the important lesson here is you're checking in with what they need before they're really, or before they voice any of their complaints. And, and, you know, you could also just open a dialogue offline or whatever, but I, I'm talking about really just being sensitive to what each player's play style is and then continuing to play to that forte before you get so caught up in your own idea of what a great game is that you're ramming all of, you know, one particular thing down their throat. Oh, it's all it's just this dungeon crawl over and over, you know, and then you find this sword and it'll, then you go to this room and there's this key, but you don't know where it goes and like all that kind of stuff, right? So, before you get to that place, just do some player check-ins. Notice when they perk up. Notice what trips them off. Notice when they get excited. Notice when you're kind of like, you know, you're doing something, and then you turn and you look at somebody whose turn it is, and they're zoned out, they're checked out. Or watch their energy across the game, right? Like, admittedly, we play till 11 or 11.30, and people are going to get tired, but what... You, you know, we started so high energy, and then you could just you could not in a bad way, but you could see people flag. Great. Well, part of that I can't control because of time and people's days and what they've been doing and all that kind of stuff, and whether they've eaten or how much caffeine they've had or whatever. Like some of that stuff is out of my control, but a big part of players' engagement is in my control. So rather than put the blinders on and do all this work, I got, I want, I've got this whole game plan. When you get done with your session, take a moment, reflect, and then adjust. All right, I feel like I've hammered that. Um, I feel like I've hammered that point into the ground, but you know, it's a case of best intentions. I went in. I want. I was. I thought I was going to put on like this firecracker combat, and I don't know that it turned out that way. It was still fun. You know, they had fun, and I, I had fun. I think there were some interesting things that came out of it. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. But I want to do a quick check-in before we move on to our last topic. I want to do a quick check-in on this type of combat, which is when you do a Rolling Thunder type of scenario like I laid out last night, which I've laid out before, here's one issue with it, is that it takes an extremely long time to execute, right? Right? So there was, there was like four or five rounds that went by before the big bad even showed up. 
Okay, well that's sort of my intent, so that they have enough time to like the 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 minions can grind down the party, and the party can grind down the minions, so they're kind of both on that razor's edge of who's going to win. And then at that point, the floodgates open, and the big bad boss comes in, and and, and it steps up the drama. But it takes all of this time to get there. And I think that's one of the dangers of like D and D combat is it really does feel like you're just sort of like you keep grinding away, grinding away, grinding away, grinding away until nobody's left on the battlefield. And when there's two guys left on the battlefield and five more guys show up, it potentially can be anticlimactic. So think about that when you're designing that sort of encounter, that rolling thunder encounter. It's, it's going to take a long time, and you may start to lose players. So one of the things that I think I could have done better was included some more dynamic elements. It was really fun to have the dragon be this wild card that's like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna make an an uh I'm gonna make a, an animal handling check. Eric did an animal handling check and he tamed the dragon. That was awesome. I wish I had more elements like that. Whether it was flaming braziers that you know you could have swung from the ceiling. I feel like the you know it's dark down here kind of factor is getting a little bit old. Uh, I need to solve that in in some way, um, but that's that's something to to consider. Is in order to make this thing spark, I think it needed a few more kind of like what I would call wild card elements, that little dynamic things that the players could notch onto. I'm going to push that guy over the ledge. I'm going to dump him into the pit. I'm going to bull rush him back into the into the corner. That sort of like that sort of dynamic fun things. Now, Mike Schley, uh, Sly Flourish would tell you, you can have all of those things if you just play this theater of the mind. I agree with him. It, it, except insofar as whether you're prepping theater of the mind or you're prepping on the grid, you still have to develop those elements. You still have to, somewhere in your notes, let the players know, oh, okay, there's, there's these swinging braziers filled with, you know, burning coals that illuminate the room and provide heat. There's this pit over here that's this old trap door that looks like it's been set off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You still have to think of those things. And if there's one place where my prep maybe could have used a little more, uh, you know, filigree, so to speak, it would be in coming up with those elements. I got really bogged down in the tactics and kind of round by round what was going to play out. And I could have spent a little more time coming up with the dynamics. Uh, Bastion Fields says, I think that one of the factors here is that this group has a really good dynamic with each other, but it's a kind of dynamic where if they were in geometry class, the teacher would make them sit on opposite ends of the room. That's sort of true. I mean, they're deliberately, like, like they're cast that way, right? Like, we, we very deliberately put these four people in this room to provide this experience. Um, knowing their different personality types and how they're going to interact and that sort of thing. And I think it's working out wonderfully. The issue is that in a combat situation like this, they don't really have the role-playing opportunities to fulfill that kind of dynamic in the same way that they can if they're either exploring on their own or negotiating with an NPC or something like that. Um, and then uh, while we're on the topic, the other thing that I want to just touch on again briefly is, you know, when we got Tales from the Yawning, Yawning Portal, when we got the book, one of the first things I said is I'm a little concerned the fact that it's seven chapters of just dungeon, dungeon, dungeon. And that potential issue looms bright in my mind when I look at what happened last night and how we're going forward. You know, I think this is a group of players that really are going to enjoy more RP opportunities. They're very much going to enjoy untangling mysteries and riddles. And if they had just have to slaughter the, their way to the bottom of White Plume Mountain in order to get the cool El Elric of Meldenbone sword, I don't think that's going to be, I think that's going to wear thin after a while. So I'm thinking of ways, or I'm, and I'm not thinking of them, but it's very, very, it, it, it's, uh, it's high in my mind on my list of concerns of, okay, well, as I'm developing this campaign going forward, what do I need to twist or alter or introduce to make things 
to give things even more opportunity for interaction rather than just solving things with the point of a sword. So that's uh, that's that's just that those are some thoughts on where we're at with the campaign and and what's happening. All right, I'm gonna cover. I'm going to cover this plot thread thing, and then we'll see where we're at in terms of time. Because I have a, possibly one other thing that I want to to do, but I might do on Tuesday. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about dead men, plants, and other plot threads. Let me. Where's my plot radar book? Wait. I. <laughs> I have a treat for you guys. Are you ready? <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> oh yeah, that's tasty. All right, so oh, I forgot my pen. I forgot my pen. I'll use this red one over here. All right, so let's talk briefly about dead men, plants, and other plot threads. We're going to check in on our plot radar, um, but first, there's there's a couple of things that came up last night that I that I do want that that I didn't expect to even introduce or whatever. Some things that I did, and uh, and I want to talk about how the players like interacted with them, responded to them, etc. So one of the things that um, that came up was they had this brief interaction with Usdrail and uh, with Erky Timbers, and he's eating this apple. <clears throat> and for those of you who didn't watch last night, as it turns out, then they sleep overnight, and in the morning, the old man's dead, and his body has sort of been consumed by this weird viney thing, and they think maybe the apple has turned him into some sort of like plant plant zombie type of creature, right? Uh, so the origin for that whole thing was two things. Number one, I didn't think that Erky Timbers needed to be an ally of theirs or needed to be an NPC that they interacted with on an ongoing basis. Now, if he was a, a, a cleric of Torm, or something like that, then I could see, oh, okay, here's a you know another possible mentor figure for Al uh, Eric's character. Grayson can, you know, learn from this guy and and take a lesson, and you know, we can really like kind of see what their relationship would develop like. But he's a cleric of Pelor, and he was just sort of. I, I felt like he was not necessary. He 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 wasn't. He wasn't somebody that I needed to include in the further adventures of the campaign. Okay, that's fine. The The other thing that struck me, I was driving... I don't remember where I was driving to, but... I was thinking about, about the, the game, and I was thinking, you know... In Dungeons & Dragons, nobody just dies in their sleep. You know? Everybody dies some, you know, weird, gory, heroic, maybe not so heroic. Probably, you know, if you're a, a, a monster, you divide, die some sort of horrible, cowardly death or something like that. So, uh, that's, that's something that just struck me. was like, nobody just passes away in their sleep, Right? Like, that happens. That still happens. I mean, even today when everybody's like, oh, they had cancer, they had a heart attack, they had, they got influenza, you know, why don't, you know they killed in a car, whatever it was. Nobody just says, oh, well, he just died in his sleep and nobody really knows. Um, it Now death always seems to have a, a, a specific cause. And I thought to myself, God, oh, wouldn't it be something, it would be a little bit poetic if, like, he had been through, or I don't know if it's poetic, ironic, what it is. Maybe it's Alanis Morissette ironic. But it would be something if he just got out of jail and he finally got through this whole horrible kind of like traumatic, almost pseudo-torture type situation and, you know, 
sunlight is literally like 600 feet away, and he's just taking a break, and then he dies overnight. Like, he, he, he dies a free man, but he dies never having seen, you know, the hills of his homeland again. I thought, well, that would, there would be something a little poetic to that. So that was the inspiration for Erky's demise. Because I really was going to have, like, just him be this, like, kind old man who, who kicks over in the night. Then I couldn't help but kind of, like, screw with the foreshadowing of the Gulthius tree and the twig blights and stuff like that. And so that's where this whole thing, like, he's just sitting there eating an apple. And I was like, oh, well, now he's eating an apple. Well, now we know where this is going, right? So, again, you know, we want to talk about, like, improvisation. The important thing is paying off your connections, right? So once that apple gets introduced, well then there's got to be a consequence if we know that the apple came from the Gulfius tree, or if we're trying to foreshadow that the Gulfius tree is an apple tree. <clears throat> you know, there's definitely a connection there that had not been brought to the fore because we skipped the Oakhurst information where, you know, the, they come in and, you know, the goblins come in and sell these things and all that kind of, that setup that just didn't speak to me. So instead, I gave him the tree, you know, I gave him the apple, and then that brought about this whole, like, transformation of his heart's been turned into this, like, knot of wood, and there's green runners that you know, have gone into his veins, and da-da-da-da. <clears throat> I'm also establishing this connection between the plants and the voices that, that Tack hears, right? So that's clearly, like, that's getting set up as well. So... All of those elements, I think, you know, it's it's you're 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 doing a fine, you're, you're kind of navigating this whole experience of, okay, well, the plants are sort of invasion of the pod people thing, where the plants take people over, so they're sort of it's an aliens kind of thing. But do they transform people? Like when I killed that guy, did I actually kill Gregory? He's got Gregory's ring, he's got Gregory's armor. Let's make an intelligence check and kind of get that back in line. Uh, the goblins have had this long-standing partnership. They've just been experimented on and tainted by Balak the Druid. So that's that's something that that popped up. Let's let's flip over to our plot radar here. Yeah, as Bastion Fields says, it planted some seeds. Pun intended. Tack is fascinated by this, the hearts and the wood. Uh, it it is. It's a, it is, as you point out, creating an interesting dynamic where the party is like, this is getting weird, and Tack is like, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so I, I want to be careful about negotiating that dynamic because it's setting Tack up for some sort of violent intervention by the rest of the party. So, and also, we just have to be a little careful of not making Amy's powers maybe 100% derived from this evil vampire tree, right? You need to think about that. Again, this is one of those balancing acts where you're inflicting some plot weirdness on a player character and you need to thread the needle on how how hard you tip the scales of, okay, well, your sister's in league with somebody who's bad. Well, let's make Gregory bad. You know, maybe maybe they were all caught up in it for whatever reason. Maybe they have to pay off Belek or whatever the deal is. So, yeah, you know, it's 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 a tricky it's tricky territory to navigate, but I think we've we've only foreshadowed things, and they still there's still plenty of things that are just Schrodinger's clues that are waiting to like get insightfully observed and turned into a hard and determined fact. Let's flip over. Their dice rolls were all over the place. Like, when when Havana rolled back-to-back -back ones, I was like, you are kidding me. Let's go over to Plot Radar. Let's see if I got this right. Oh, look at that. God. This works so good. So, what are the goblins up to? I don't feel like we've established that very well. You know, there's other there's another thing that I need to put out here as like mm, dangling. Nah, it's really dormant. You can't see over here. Mm. 
Goblin Uprising in Neverwinter Wood. Okay, so that's something that we need to think about. All right, so let's just run down the line here. <clears throat> What's Gregory and Dell's deal? Well, this is getting even more and more problematic, right? Talk, tax voices, we can add something to here. I guess we'll just put the apple wood. And when it, you know, when it was beating between her fingers, that was creepy. And the rest of the play party doesn't see it. Creepy. Uh, so that was that was interesting. Uh, Bastion Fields is filled with uh, with great insights today. I think it works the other way too, where Amy slash Tack is realizing something weird is going on because the others can't quite see it, and so it makes her want to figure it out more because they can't see it than it is turning her into an outcast. And that may be true. That uh, you know, that will be interesting to. I think as this connection between the wood and her powers becomes a little more obvious, I think that will help. So here's 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 the part of it that I hinted at last night that I think can turn the situation around. Because right now everybody's worried, like, oh, Amy's gonna be overwhelmed by this weird wood that's gonna, you know, that's this vampire wood or you know, aliens pervert, like weirdo wood that's gonna like turn her into a zombie, and she's gonna turn evil and she's gonna turn the rest of us into zombies or whatever it is, right? Here's the twist that will enable us to take this from a situation where the party is concerned about Amy to the party actually sees this as beneficial. And that's if, using her psychic powers, she can somehow either command the wood or directly, like, she has, uh, it does extra damage against the Gulfius tree or whatever the case may be, where because of the connection, she can utilize that as, as leverage against the evil, domineering, like whatever nefarious force is, right? So I think that, um, and we had a moment of that where, like, you know, the, the two of them locked eyes and then, like, you know, the, the goblin leader, Dern, pushed her out of his brain or whatever it was. Um, I think if we have a thing where she can actually, like, command one of the twig blights, that will turn this whole situation from, like, we're really worried about what, what's going on with Amy to... Oh, maybe she can control this. Like maybe this is giving us a ray of sunshine. So I, th I think that's a twist that w we want to. I'm gonna put that down here. Again, some of the stuff, some of it you can see, and some of it you can't. So, tack possesses slash commands twig blades. All right, that's down here is a spark. I think that's honestly, that's maybe approaching and maybe how Thon's father really died. I, yeah, I think I, I'm even going to... I want to put that up here because I like that idea. I don't want that one to go away. All right. Uh, Goblin's response to the PC raid. Hey, welcome everybody to a thing called Closed and Retired. Okay, Goblin Leader is different. Closed and Retired. Now, one of the reasons I suggest that you take a picture of this before you start moving all this stuff around is so that you can go back. I'm going to start getting a stack of these things that don't matter anymore, and I'm going to want to throw them away. But it's nice to... You've got some of these things that you're going to want to bring back into the plot. What are the kobolds up to? Well, that might come back later. This... What is Avril's deal? We can throw that one away. That one's done. Right? So, I, I think it, it, it would be valuable for this particular, you know, if you're going to use this particular tool, to go ahead and take snapshots of it and just sort of file them in whatever filing mechanism you want to do. All right. Belak the Druid. The Twig Blights were actually, they were introduced last night. So they're now immediate. I think approaching us tech possesses or commands them. That'll be interesting. This birdsong prophecy, I'm more and more inclined to make it the role-playing hook that we talked about. 
the Golfius tree really is starting to move into approaching. My Iron Keep. So, this Goblin Uprising Neverwood is out here. The other thing that I want to... Hmm, sorry. There's a Goblin Uprising going on in the Neverwinter Wood. That's, that's a dormant thing that they know about that they've forgotten about. But the other big one here is the... Kundrukar scroll fragment. They got that uh, not this past session, but the week before. Uh, Avril picked it up out of the dragon's nest, and I mentioned it to them. They know about it. They've forgotten about it. Now, I could have brought it up at the top of the session when I was talking about all the things that they found. I said something like, oh, you found a dwarven flask and you found a couple things in the nest or whatever. And I didn't explicitly mention it. I believe she has it written down. But I'm sure if it had come up, like, that would have explored it. Now, one of the reasons I let it go was we were already doing enough kind of... Um, Extra, not extraneous, but we're already off on a tangent with Erky Timbers and talking about whether he was going to get a bath or not, that having a whole nother idea of, you know, introducing this whole thing that's related to the Iron Keep, because this scroll fragment specifically points to the Iron Keep, that, that I felt like that was going to take the group in a whole nother direction. And so I would rather reintroduce this somewhere. If they, if they, if they remember it, great, it'll come up fine. But if they've forgotten about it, I'm going to leave it dormant until it suits the pacing and the plotting a little bit better. Uh, Bastion Fields says, Regarding Thawne and his dad and bringing Garab into the plot more, could Rainmaker poss possibly be made from Gulthius wood, at least in part, or maybe from some opposing wood? <clears throat> so that's that, that, that might work. We would need to set that up. I'm gonna put. I'm just gonna put that down as a spark. You know, the great thing about this is I don't have to like these. None of these have to be real, right? I'm gonna put that down as a spark. Is Rainmaker made of, for lack of a better term, holy or divine? All right. I'm gonna put that. I'm gonna put that over here, or just I don't know. These these columns don't really match up with it. Like sparks, this doesn't necessarily have a one for one timeline attached to it. But I that is an interesting idea, right? Okay. Anything else that's that's living out here? A shardalon. Is there anything else that came up last night? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Now we did have this goblin leader is different thing. We did have this fairly dramatically. I think that we need to look at, we need to put something on here called the twisted results The twisted results of Belloc's experimentation. And I think that needs to come up next. It's, it's, it's an in tandem with Twig Blitz. But I think this is a good element to get on our board. Right? Oh, if, if Tack could hear Rainmaker too? <laughs> that would be interesting as well. The twisted results of Belloc's experimentation. You know, there is a laboratory level on the in the grove. And I would like to hit, I mean, we've already hit it pretty hard. You know, it's, it's almost like straddling this. I think, I think it's just sitting like burning in the immediate column now, at this point. It was, it was hinted at last session and went from being this kind of like weird distant thing that they didn't even know about or they maybe vaguely knew about. Or maybe it was more of like a dangling thing that they didn't know it was 
connected. It leaped right over all of this stuff, boom, to right into immediate. Like we, we addressed some of that. They don't know who's behind it or how it works, but it's definitely a major theme that's happening right now. It's a major plot element. So the last thing I want to talk about, and then I should probably wrap it up for the day, I like the idea that maybe somebody could talk to Rainmaker. I, it feels a little on the nose to make his bow some like have some sort of unlocked potential. That's my only thing. Is like, it's very. I almost I almost am tempted to go against stereotype and have his bow just be something that he uses for its sentimental value. And maybe go along more of the lines of like a World of Warcraft type of approach where you have a jewel, you know, or a socket, you know, something like you could put a you could put a ring, a magical ring on it, or band or something like that, or gem that would give it enhanced abilities, as opposed to like, oh, I gotta get rid of this this as opposed to the other alternatives, which are one, I gotta get rid of this let you know, this item that my this sentimental item that my father gave me because I found a plus one bow. Or, number two, oh, well, my father's bow, it turns out, is fulfilled with magical p potential, and all I have to do is the proper incantations, and it turns out it was handed down by the archangel, da da, da. you know. Like, that's, obviously, that's an extreme, but those are, like, two, the two most common choices you make when you're playing somebody with a signature weapon, is, do I trash this thing that I invested a lot of backstory in but has no mechanical effect, or does the DM bend to my will and give me this heretofore unknown unlocked potential um, that, that that you can brandish. So I, I'm I'm tempted to kind of find a third third way out of that conundrum. Speaking of conundrums, this is the last thing I want to address and then we'll wrap it up for the day. And uh, thank God the landscapers are gone. I'm I'm really sorry about that guys. Um I don't like to reschedule a stream, and I would I would have strongly considered it if I'd known they were going to come in here. Usually he comes in and he blows for five minutes and it's gone, but today it was a wreck. So the last thing I want to talk about is I've painted myself in a corner. I've painted myself in a corner with my plot threads and with some of my development because I've murdered most of the goblins. Okay, And specifically, I've murdered Dern and his associates. Okay? It's fairly well established that Usedrail doesn't know a lot. Usedrail's not really on, like, in knows exactly who the goblins are in cahoots with or what's going on. So I need to do some sort of info dump on to kind of foreshadow Belloc and what's going on on the Grove level. I don't just want to send them in there without any idea of what's happening. But... I, I'm in trouble because you know, the neighbor kid's having a hard time getting into his apartment. Um, but I, I'm in, I'm I'm in a little bit in trouble because I can't have like a role playing scene. What it would you know, given what we just talked about in terms of how everybody likes to their play style and all that kind of stuff. It would be great if maybe that that scene that combat scene had ended with Dern like kind of like laying down his sword and saying. You have two choices. You can either slay me and never know what's truly going on in the grove below, or you can let me go and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. That would have been a great moment of drama and maybe would have been a more interesting offer than just him fighting to the death. You know, in the book as written, he does fight to the death, especially if there's kobolds involved. Um... So I want to, you know, we'll come back, we'll come back around. And we'll talk about this on Tuesday. But that's one of the issues I've created for myself is I need to find a way, whether it might be a journal entry or some goblins who are left behind, who are frightened, who are like, "We come to surrender," or do those goblins bug out and go down to Belloc? Or you know, somehow I need to convey like and foreshadow. Okay, well, if you go down this shaft, you're going to encounter even more dark forces. 
So that's the other classic D&D issue is when you have all of the combatants fight to it to the death, you no longer have a very easy, very approachable conduit for how for conveying relevant plot information, right? Regardless of how much, you know, the the ripe role playing opportunities that you've now denied yourself by presenting them with a corpse rather than a living being with nefarious intent and duplicitous um, inclination, you've also forced yourself to invent a new way to convey, here's where you go next, here's, here's some more crumbs, follow the trail. Some, some crumbs go off this way, but this, the, the, the main batch seem to go off this way. Whatever. So, again, when I look back on Okay, here's how I set this up, and here's how it played out. It played out exactly like I anticipated, but here are the consequences of having him fight to the death. And we had on that on the on the planning sheet think about win win conditions for the party as well as for the bad guys. Think about when they would surrender or when they would retreat. And I could have put some more time into that too, and I didn't. Okay. Problematic. A uh, couple things. We're gonna pick up some comments, and uh, so Bastion feels on the on the topic of legendary weapons. Maybe it could be less of a maybe Rainmaker could be less of a legendary weapon, and could have just come from the same forest as the Goldfish tree, and that's the only connection. Uh, for instance, maybe his dad dad died because he was nosing around that forest for more choice trees to turn into bows, and stumbled upon the wrong one. So. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I don't know if if you've watched the episode where we brought up the idea that maybe Thon's father was poisoned, and specifically maybe Thon's father was poisoned using a poison brewed by Belloc, but administered by the mayor. Like uh, I think the mayor and his wife could be in cahoots on this whole thing. Like the mayor and his wife and Gregory, and. When the players figured that out, maybe there's you know some some sheriffs, rangers <clears throat> standing at the ready to go find out what they know. Like I think I think the mayor sent the party up there because he's like, oh, Gregory was supposed to be back by now, and he's not. And shit, I need somebody to go do this. And if I send my my trusted sheriff and her entourage up there, there's nobody to guard the town. And it seems fishy, and not only that, but she might find out something snoopy going on. So, uh, Bastion Fields also says, I noticed something interesting last night that might be a way to connect to some other elements of the plots. Do we know how the dragon statues play into things at all? So, one of the... Yeah, that's the tough part. So what I've decided is that this jade... So the, the Gothias tree, when it absorbs the body of a creature, it turns their bone into jade. So their their bone doesn't isn't isn't ivory or whatever. It 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 becomes jade and then things are, are you know people carve and craft things out of it. So that's the twist. And if you notice, I've described the statuettes as they're white with these green veins. If you noticed, and this was somewhat serendipitous, but also somewhat just like good improv is repeating elements that you've introduced before. When Erky Timbers died, his body was white and pale with these green vines going through it. I, I don't want to paint myself as some sort of like foreshadowing genius, but if you put the tools in place to help set up a plausible explanation, it just makes the delivery so much more satisfying to the players than if you're suddenly like, uh, well, that's, those, those things are like that because who knows why? Uh, because uh, the Belloc carved him and it got some of his essence into him. Like, that's fine. It's just not as rewarding. If we get to the Gothias tree, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm going to attach this onto uh, onto our plot radar. The Gothias tree turns bone into jade. So that's that. 
So yeah, it's like a it it could be like a, a version of petrified wood or whatever. What is a sh a ship of Theseus weapon comes up somehow? Oh, okay. So Thomas Thomas Young says maybe you could have a ship of Theseus type weapon where you upgrade parts of it and gradually become something new, but it's still the same. Yeah, yeah. So and and just to clarify, because I didn't know this either, but a ship of Theseus is a philosophical thought experiment. Gradually over time, every plank of the ship is replaced. Is it still the same ship? <laughs> it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know, so this this also brings up uh, a purely mechanical dis discussion of with the bumps and inspiration advantages that the party has available to them. How much do they really need magical weapons? And I don't think you know they've got a huge advantage on the power curve right now, where they can juice their roll by up to plus three. And that's significant. That's that's not a, and not only that, but their their stats are a little on the beefy side too. So between those two things, I don't know that this is going to be a problem that I really have to tackle very aggressively, because I think they have, uh, I think they're doing pretty good in terms of the power curve, their ability to handle themselves. So. Whether he gets a magical bow or not, I don't think it's that important. And, and you know, it could be argued that his one cool thing could be part of his bow or something like that. So that's um, that's that's not something I'm super super concerned with. Uh, it, it's not it's not something that's weighing heavily on my mind. Is how do I get them more magical equipment? We've we've handed them quite a few things that honestly they haven't used much of. They didn't use the elixir of health. Uh, they've got a scroll now that has some spells on it. They they didn't even remember that they had the candle. The only magic item that they've really been using hard is the uh, the nightcaller whistle that creates <laughs> creates Ronald P.P. Dusty Bones. So <clears throat> big shout out to DJ Regular. I'm sorry you think we're talking about you every time <laughs> that we talk about Ronald. Uh, if if we if we were, it would only be lovingly. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not super concerned with making sure that they get plus one armor, plus one weapons, anything like that. I think the party is on the upper end of the power curve and can apply force when necessary, and they don't need any of that kind of gilding ability that a, a, a magic item is going to provide. So, do 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 do. Baston Fields points out if they're not inherently powerful in some way, they could have markings on them that, if a range would spell something out. So that would be interesting too to have these little dragon figures that you know had runes on them, and when you arrange them in certain ways, they create um, they they unlock different powers. You know, I I ran a uh, an event once at Gamehole Con that uh, God, what did I even call it? Cutthroat Dungeon is what I called it, and then it had all these sort of gaming related RPG gaming related challenges to that. And one of the characters was a wizard. Was it was really Gandalf, right, or Merlin, or something like that? Some super powerful wizard. But the way that he cast spells was he had a bag of Scrabble tiles, and in order to cast a spell, he had to cast whatever spell he wanted by by drawing tiles out of the bag and spelling something. So if you wanted to cast Fireball, you had to have those letters in front of you. And I think there were some constraints about how you could how many letters you could pull and whether you could discard letters and all that sort of stuff. But I think that's a fascinating idea that if we got her six, you know, little dragon figures that had maybe, you know, two vowels and four consonants on them and you could arrange them in different ways, they would unlock different powers. That would be cool. That's an interesting idea. I like that I like that mental challenge of having those props to move around. I think it could be an interesting play experience. All right. <laughs> yes, we'll only refer to DJ Regular as PP Dusty Bones, and that way no one will get confused as to which Ronald we're talking about. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right. So uh, that is that is our discussion for the day. Again, I apologize for the landscapers causing such uh, havoc. Uh, it was an interesting session last night. There's a lot of lessons learned today. 
Uh, thank you for sitting through this and, and talking through these. are really like laying bare bones my thoughts. A big shout out to James V for the great uh, two camera setup. I really, uh, I really appreciate being able to run this so that I'm talking to you in a window that's not like right up my nose, right? So, so that's great. Um, and I want to thank everybody who tuned in last night. Thanks for telling your friends and whatnot. Uh, I, I think we're going to have some interesting prep talk on Tuesday. And uh, let's take a look at the rest of the calendar for the week. Before, I mean, yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at, I did that on purpose, you guys. I just like that Photoshop so much. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the week, uh, tonight is Crit Juice. Oh, it's the Crit Juice. Come and join the boys who drink the Crit Juice. So keep that up if you're not otherwise engaged. Uh, 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 tomorrow, before we get to tomorrow's schedule, I want to say um, there's a big event happening with Wizards uh, uh, Twitch channel. They're doing this thing called Stream of Annihilation. It is literally 24 hours. Well, it's... 24 hour, non consecutive hours of gaming that's all related to the big launch event, which, I mean, it is the big launch event for whatever their next announcement is. I'm not really at liberty to say, although I'm a little surprised nobody's broken the press embargo just yet. I suppose sometime around midnight European time we can expect somebody to start spilling the beans, but. Um, uh, they've got uh, you know a, a huge string of streamers from around the world, honestly, who are going to be participating in this thing, and that starts tomorrow morning at ten o'clock Pacific time. Uh, if you if you don't tune in, and and that's totally up to you. Uh, uh, you know, I will say that Wizards uh, has gotten behind streaming in a very big way. And uh, we're certainly reaching out to them to, you know, do to, to create a more mutually beneficial partnership on that front as well uh, here at Saving Throw Show. But, you know, they're they're all in on this on the streaming front and understandably so. So you may want to tune in between 10 and 10 Pacific and 10 p.m. Pacific it starts at 10 in the morning uh, and, and goes for 12 hours. And then they take a break and they come back at 10 on on Saturday, uh, you know, Ivan Van Norman's going to be there. Matt Mercer's going to be there. Adam Cable, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, is going to be there. So check those guys out. Um, the oh, there's an all-girl gaming gang, and I can't remember their handle, but they're going to be there as well. <clears throat> At any rate, uh, I think it's going to be a big announcement. I'm excited about what they're potentially going to propose. And I think it'll have implications for what we do going forward with Saving Throw. They've been whipping the PR drum on this for, you know, two weeks now at least. So <clears throat> I would suggest you tune in or at least grab, you know, sit on Twitter or or pull up to EN World or wherever you get your RPG news. Reddit, I guess. I don't, I'm not a Reddit guy, sorry. But check out and see what um, see what they're up to, I think. I think it'll be fun to talk about that a little bit next week. Also next week, I hope to be able to do a little flip through. I got the Blades in the Dark special edition. I backed the Kickstarter and got the special edition KS. And next week, hopefully, I will do a flip through um, kind of thoughts, first impressions on, on the book. Um, Blades in the Dark is out. It, uh, <laughs> you may have a, a tough time finding it because it has sold out in several channels. But you can get it through IndiePressRevolution.com. Uh, you can definitely get it there. And Evil Hat has plenty on on hand. They just need to get them from a warehouse to a distributor to your game store. Logistical, moving, pushing, shoving, fighting match. So, uh, so I'm hoping to talk about Blades in the Dark either next Tuesday or Thursday. I need to. I literally got the book like ten minutes before I walked in the door here to get the stream started. So. <clears throat> that's um, that's I, I I didn't feel like I could do it justice today by flipping through it on the stream, other than just going like, oh, it's so pretty, and that doesn't necessarily help you guys that much. So let's take a look at the rest of the calendar. <clears throat> uh, this that that book is called Blades in the Dark. Let me let me put it in the chat.
And for those of you who are not familiar, John Harper is, is the creator of, of Blades. And uh, when we go back and look at the Beastlings stuff that I created, that was all inspired by Wildlings. If you've ever played Danger Patrol, um, that's, that's his game. Um, Blades is kind of his biggest effort. Uh, Lady Blackbird is also a game. He's done a bunch of kind of like cutting edge micro games. And this is really, I would say, his biggest published effort to date. Uh, and there's tons of streams out there that cover Blades in the Dark. So go check it out. It's an interesting system. I'm just a huge fan of John Harper. I was like, I don't care how this plays. I want to help him be successful and create whatever the next thing is that he's going to create. So that's 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 my slant on that. Uh, so you can you can take take on Crit Juice tonight at uh, at eight o'clock Pacific. Tomorrow night we're doing sort of these vignettes of wild cards, um, standalone not not necessarily vignettes but standalone adventures uh, after the big campaign finale from last week. So check that out with uh, Jordan Caves Callerman on the on 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 the DM screens. Uh, Saturday is Phoenix Dawn Command with Max Beauvais at 12.30 p.m. And then on Sunday, if you want to go back and you want to catch us on demand with the um, with the YouTube archive or however you want to get back around, then I will be back here on Tuesday. I can't remember what's coming up next Monday night. Oh, I know exactly what's coming up next Monday night. Next Monday night, Eric Reichard is running Honey Heist. <laughs> Put this in your calendar. You're gonna want to. Uh, we're gonna want to want to run. Watch this. Uh, Honey Heist is a game where it is a one-page role-playing game where you are bears who commit heists, and you have two stats. I believe they are bear and heist, and that's kind of like the whole framework of the game. It sounds fascinating. It's also Eric's birthday, so uh, an added incentive to go and uh, show him some love on the stream. Well, that's Monday, so put that in your calendars for Monday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, Eric on RPG Expl Exploration Society is running Honey Heist. <laughs> um, my wife is going to be mad that she doesn't get to play it because she wants to play this game so badly. All right. Very good. Uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks to Fockwad for moderating. Thank you to Bastin Fields and DJ Regular and uh, all of uh, Thomas Young and all of our, our people here in the chat who... Um, contributed to today's discussion. I appreciate each and every one of you uh, tuning in and uh, and sharing your thoughts and ideas as I talk through this. Every time I you know, give you a piece of advice that makes you a better uh, DM and then you reflect something new back to me, it also makes me a better DM. So I love the fact that this is a conversation. I don't feel like, you know, it would be as valuable if I just sat here and, and gave you high-minded lectures. <laughs> it's... That's not the approach that I want to take. So that is the that that is that is our show for today, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me, and until next time, let's dungeon. Oh, I don't even have my mouse hooked up, you guys. I got it off the trackpad. Yes, trackpad. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>